This is episode 95 of Offscript with Trish Glow's intimate interviews and fun conversations with interesting people. Joining me via Skype today is Joe Spurgeon, financial advisor with LPL Financial. You know, it's just habit for me to say intimate interviews with interesting people, fun conversations. I don't know how fun this is going to be today. Huh. I mean, is it? You might be right. Okay. I was. How much fun are we going to talk? Joe, as a lot of you know, is our financial advisor, meaning our, meaning KTVL's financial advisor. You've been coming on the new newscast on Wednesdays talking about finances for how long now? I'm not exactly sure. I know that it was really near uh, the time that my daughter was born Mm -hmm. and she's now almost 18. And so I'm going to say I was coming on Yep, she's she's going to be 18 in May. How's that even possible? Um, I thought she was still like 8. I know. It time time really flies. It really does. Um, and you blink, right? Yeah, we we had a picture of her where we stuck her in a pumpkin <laughs> uh, cuz she was small enough that she fit in the pumpkin around Halloween. And I'd been on for a while then. And so, yeah, it's been 16, 17 years um, that I've been coming down there. Right. Well, we certainly appreciate it, Joe. Um, but also your real job, <laughs> you, are a, you are a financial advisor. You just don't play one on TV. How long have you been doing that for? I've been a financial advisor for approximately 20 years. And uh, before that, I taught uh, junior and high school English. So, okay. Uh, be- between age 22 and 30, I was a teacher. And then uh, between 30 and 50, um, I've been a financial advisor. I just turned 50 today. And so uh, I thought it was odd that I'm doing the podcast on my birthday. Uh, Happy but I am. Happy birthday, so, Joe Spurgeon. <laughs> what? Oh, there you This is an off script where- first. Is this, uh, I wonder if my, if my birthday gift is doing this podcast, so. <laughs> Man, I didn't know, I didn't realize it was your birthday. I would have had a cake with maybe, or a cupcake with a candle on it. Happy birthday, buddy. That's awesome. Well, but before we get into some serious things, yes. something that I think is hilarious is um, I went down to the DMV yesterday because my driver's license is expiring today. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're all locked. And uh, I thought, okay, the DMV is not an essential service, I guess, so it's closed. But thank heavens to Betsy that Baskin Robbins is still open because I love ice cream cakes. And when we're done with this interview, I have to go pick up my birthday ice cream cake. So it's funny what's what what is still open and what I guess is an essential service, which is Baskin Robbins, but the DMV. Mm-mm. I'll be driving with an expired license here pretty soon, I guess. So, it just we got to really put things in a perspective, don't we? Um, so yeah. I was going to ask, you were a teacher, and then you said you became a financial advisor. Why did you get into that? Oh, I don't know. I think I kind of got burnt out teaching. Um, I have a tremendous amount of respect for teachers, and. Uh, my daughter has done a lot of speech and debate in the last few years. And, you know, on a, if you have a Saturday speech and debate tournament, you'll all r- arrive at seven o'clock in the morning and register. And the events will go till eight or nine o'clock at night. And then those teachers will get back on a bus and drive home. Um, and it, it's reminded me, you know, how hard teachers work. And, um, being a financial advisor, you can make a whole lot more money and uh, you don't have to work as hard. Uh, there are times like 2020, which are very difficult and they're hard for clients, but um, it's uh, w- with teaching, you can work and work and work. Nobody pays you anymore for it. And uh, if you run your own business, if you're a financial advisor, if you do something else, you can set the amount of time you want to work and normally you're rewarded pretty greatly for that. Okay. And so in your day-to-day job, and I don't want to talk about what that looks like right now, but let's say before all of this, your day-to-day job, you're helping people with their finances. You're helping them manage. You're throwing money in the stock market for them. Mm -hmm. How does that work? 
Well, I have about 110 households. Um, and so I don't know how many actual clients that is because, you know, some people are married, some people have kids. I, I try to help them, you know, plan for college. You know, how much money are we going to need so they can send their son or daughter off, off to college? Um, mostly what I do is retirement planning where we're looking at how much money uh, the couple or an individual is going to need um, when it comes time to retire. Um, you know, it's kind of scary right now because the market's in a little bit of turmoil. Um, but those are the things that you just try to help people meet their financial goals the best you can. Okay. So when we started to go through this as a country, and this meaning COVID-19, obviously, uh, that was, you know, mid-March as we're starting to see some things um, happen. And really March 16th, 17th, I believe it was, we got the shutdown order here in Oregon that restaurants, bars, wineries, all these things are closing and then comes unemployment. At what point in March are you are you going, oh, crap? Wow, that's a technical question. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, Pretty early on in March, uh, the market was incredibly volatile. I mean, you've got, you know, 1,000, 2,000 point swings in the Dow. Um, I knew we were going to have incredible problems. Um, but but let, me, let me answer one of, the, one of the things I wanted to cover was pandemics. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so in March, I'm incredibly worried about you know, the volatility of the stock market. I'm trying to figure out um, where the market's going to go. And on a conference call with some of our analysts, um, they talked about past pandemics. And so in 1918, we had the Spanish flu. And in a lot of our history books, we sort of remember that, okay? And the stock market dropped about 33%. And we had 675,000 deaths in the United States of America. And you can look at that pandemic and you can say, okay, the stock market is very different um, from what it was in 1918. So then we fast forward to 1968 um, when we have the Hong Kong flu and we lose about 100,000 Americans and the stock market drops 36%. So we look at those two pandemics from the past, and you talk about March being in a lot of turmoil. Uh, the market low was March 23rd at this point, and I hope we don't go back there. The, the Dow closed at like 17,000 something. So from the peak in the market to March 23rd, the stock market lost 34%. And so I'm not saying it's, it, it can't go lower than that, but if you look at these three pandemics that we've had, 1918, 1968, and 2020, the stock market loses about a third of its value. And so once I realized that, and once I had that information, that gave me uh, a lot more ammunition to talk to clients about and also to try to decide, okay, what do we do? You know, do we buy? Do we sell? Um, and all of that has a lot to do with the individual investor. Um, one of the things that I did in March was I called all of my households, and my biggest concern with them was their emergency funds. You know, do you have some money in checking or savings, or do we have some money here at LPL that is in cash? So I don't have to sell a security when I don't want to, when, when the market is down. Okay. And you said looking back at those pandemics gave you ammunition. How so? What do you mean? Just to, just to show this is what's happened before? It's, it's happened to us before? We'll get through it? Is that what you mean by that? Yeah. I think it was helpful to, to put some things in context. And... Mm -hmm. I've had a lot of questions and a lot of people being very concerned about the Great Depression, okay? In the Great Depression, stocks lost about 90% of their value. And, and so I had clients asking me, you know, can that happen? 
And the honest answer is, well, maybe. I mean, it, it, it's possible. I mean, so you, you never want to tell somebody, well, gee, that can never happen because that's, that's not accurate. Um, but I think it made a lot of clients feel better when I said, hey, we have gone through this before. You know, a lot of times you're hearing, oh, we've never gone through this before. Well, we have. We went through it 50 years ago, and we went through it 50 years before that. We've gone through pandemics before. How do the markets react to that? Mm -hmm. And in the past, they've gone down about a third. And so, you know, that is much better than what happened during the Great Depression. And so we can have that conversation and and at least have some context for maybe what this is going to be like. Okay. And then this is this is may, maybe a, a dumb question. People say there's no such thing as dumb questions. I disagree. There's absolutely really stupid questions out there. How does the start, stock market translate to me, to us, to our community, our economy? That, there's a whole bunch of questions there. Sorry. Um, <laughs> You know, how it translates to you is, I, I think you have a 401k down there at the TV station, correct? I certainly do. Okay. So when the market takes a hit like this, um, if you're contributing on a monthly basis, you're buying in to these stocks at a lower price. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 5, 10, 20 years from now, I'm not going to ask you how old you are, but I'm 50. Um you, you know, you, you will be looking to retire. Um, but, but for you personally, as someone who I consider to be uh, in that younger group or, or have quite a few years before retirement, I don't think you worry about the stock market that much. Um, for people that are getting closer to retirement or maybe are retired, it has quite a bit of an impact on them. Um, the biggest problem that a pullback in the market has on people is when they are making withdrawals. Because if they're selling something on a monthly basis, whereas you and your 401k are buying every month, if they're selling something monthly um, to cover their expenditures, they're now having to sell more of that stock or that mutual fund to cover expenditures and they're having to sell things when they're down. And that's going to be a problem for people. Okay. And yes, I, I have a 401k. I've had a 401k since I was 22. Should I be worried about that right now? Or do, do I not need to worry about it because I'm 40 years old and I'm, I'm not going to retire anytime soon and the markets could bounce back? Um, yeah, I wouldn't. For you, I wouldn't be that worried about it. I right. mean, uh, yeah, you're 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 able to buy in at, uh, at at better values today than you were a few months ago. So this some of this sounds harsh, but you know, to young people, it's like, hey, be quiet and and keep buying in monthly. You're going to be fine. You know, twenty or thirty years from now, the stock market's going to be in a much different place. You're right. Um, people just about ready to retire or trying to retire they have a they have a whole that's a whole nother kettle of fish right exactly and you didn't sound harsh so you essentially just told me to be quiet <laughs> <laughs> i never want to say that to you trish <laughs> uh, um let's talk really quickly about the stimulus checks that some people are getting um, and it ranges, yeah. right? Anywhere it depends on how much you're making is is dependent on how much you're getting. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, I want, I want to spend some time on the stimulus checks, um, and maybe most of the time. Uh, with with my accountant, um, we talked a little bit about you know, are we going to get a stimulus check? And her estimate was that um, we might get around two thousand dollars. So. We're close to that, um, the phase out where, you know, if you make a certain amount of money, uh, your, your stimulus check is lowered um, or maybe you're not going to get a stimulus check at all. And I think that the stimulus checks are good. I think they, they needed to happen. And, you know, if my clients are listening or other people are, 
and you need to pay your rent or your mortgage or you need to buy food, you get that stimulus check and you take care of your family. Um, I talked to my wife about the stimulus check and quite frankly, we were embarrassed um, because I've been working at home for 16 years and I'm still working at home. Uh, you know, it, it hasn't changed that much for me. Will I make less money in 2020 than I did in 2019? Probably, because this, the stock market's down a little bit. But I'm still working. Um, I still teach one class at Rogue Community College. And I'm horrible at Zoom, but I'm Zooming right along and, and trying to get them through. And, you know, RCC is still paying me. My wife, bless her heart, is, uh, is a lab tech out at the VA, and every day she's going to work. Mm. So the Spurgeon household, our money's coming in, okay? And so on this podcast, something that I think we need to, we need to think about is we've got incredibly long lines at food banks. We've got people who are out of work. And so we're not sure if, we, if we're getting $2,000 from the government or not, because who knows? And who knows when those checks are getting here? We keep hearing that they're coming and then they don't arrive. <laughs> so who knows? But, but I talked to my wife and I said, hey, I'm going to be embarrassed to get this stimulus money because we don't need it. Mm -hmm. And so um, we took that $2,000 number and we doubled it and we sent a check to, to access food share. And I think that that's something that's really important um, during this crisis is that if you still have your job um, and you're still doing okay, uh, you might want to think about if you've got something extra or something left over of making a donation to Access or Salvation Army, because there are a whole lot of people that are struggling out there right now. Right. And, you know, there were people struggling before this and there are people who are seriously struggling now and and the population has only gotten much much larger since we sort of shut down everything so you're suggesting for those for those who need that stimulus check and i've heard this from a few financial advisors prioritize right Pri prioritize what needs to be paid right now yes and 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 if you're one of those people that um you know lost your job um, take that stimulus check and, and it, it's for your family. I mean, take, take, take care of your family. Um, and that's, and that's the other thing too, when you're talking about prioritizing things, um, that's tough right now. Mm -hmm. Um, I've got a friend who's, who's, who's a banker and everybody's asking to defer their commercial loans and their, um, their, their residential mortgages. Um, and, and, and as a family, you're going to have to decide, you know, what are the priorities to pay? And I would think that, you know, probably your mortgage or your rent would be pretty high. I think, you know, probably buying food for your family is going to be the most important. Um, and I, I hope that some lenders are able to defer, mm -hmm. um, you know, payments for people. Uh, but that's also very difficult as well because let, let's say your lender can say, okay, well, don't pay me for a few months, but what if they owe somebody else up the food chain? And so it's incredibly complex, uh, you know, dealing with all these payments and, uh, and with that. One of the things I'd like to circle back on uh, with access when I was sending in the check, I was told that um, – one dollar with one dollar since they buy in bulk they mm -hmm. could they could do uh four meals and so my my check is possibly sixteen thousand meals um at access and one of the things that that they they want especially now is they're better off getting a cash donation because they can go out and buy bulk and i guess they're struggling a little bit with um with with like a food donation because they're hope they don't want it to be contaminated. Sure. So yeah, you don't you, you don't know where it came from. 
Um, no, that's awesome. Yeah. And and I appreciate that that you and your family did that. That's that's amazing. What do you say to those people who, you know, are working? They get a stimulus check and they dump it right back into the economy, meaning they they make sure they use it to, at local restaurants or local retail stores. I think I think that's a great idea too. Um, you know, we we want to keep those retail locations open, um, and you know, you can't just not spend because if 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 everybody does that, then your friend's business is going to close down. Um, but you also can't spend if you don't have any money if if, if you've lost your job, and so. Um, it's it's going to be pretty difficult, but I would definitely support uh, local businesses as much as we can in this time. Okay. Uh, we already talked about this just a touch, but our 401ks, um, for those of us who are working right now, but even I think about my parents who, you know, they have money in the stock market. They're retired, um, but that's, you know, a source of, of income at, at some point. Um, should we not even look? <laughs> At, at our 401k, should we look at those statements? Should we just not even look, just throw them away right now? I, I would not advise that, and I don't think my company would enjoy that advice, but I, I have had a lot of clients say to me, you know, Joe, I'm just not going to open my statement mm -hmm. right now. Right. And if, if that is how they're going to deal with um, this issue, then, you know, that might be okay for, for some individuals. Um, because, you know, some people, some people can really get upset and, and maybe make a poor decision. Um, with a lot of my retirees, I've had conversations like this where I've said, hey, is your social security check still being deposited? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, are you still getting your check from PERS each month or if they have a pension plan? And they're like, yeah, I'm still getting that. And, you know, do you still have X dollars with me at LPL? And they're like, yeah. And then I say, okay, well, there's a whole lot of people that have lost their job that aren't retired, you know, that have no income. And so, you know, you're doing okay. And, I think if you put that in some context, um, maybe it makes them feel a little bit better. But let me segue to something here real quick. Um, when we went down 34%, um, and that hopefully ended on March 23rd, I think the market high was sometime in January or February, and then we dropped down 34%. That was the fastest that we dropped that amount in the stock market's history. Mm -hmm. We dropped 34% in 19 days. During the Great Depression, it took 37 days. And then in the Great Depression, of course, it just kept going down. But my point there is, is that if your parents or my clients or myself have just had a giant freak out during that time um, and have, have been all emotional, that's probably pretty realistic because we just haven't had something like that um, in our lifetimes. During the financial crisis in 2008 and 2009, we dropped 53%, but it took us about 15 months. We dropped 34% in 19 days. Yeah. And so when people say, hey, I'm upset, I'm losing sleep, I'm like, yeah. You should be. Right. You know? Right. It's, well, it's scary. Speaking of that, what what keeps you up at night? What's making you lose sleep right now? Um, I'm feeling a lot better than than I did a few weeks ago, um, stock market wise, because the market seems to have stabilized. Okay, a little bit. So I'm I'm not as freaked out with with the market as I was. Um. I think the other thing that that is good for me is I've called, you know, 110 clients. I don't know anybody personally um, that is sick. And so in some ways, I'm kind of insulated mm -hmm. in that 
I don't know people and I don't have family members who are dealing with, um, with, the, with the coronavirus. Um, my daughter, who's a high school senior, is spending a lot of time with dad. And um, I'm sure she didn't think she was going to spend her senior year uh, making grilled cheese sandwiches at lunch every day with dad. Um, and, you know, we're just trying to socially distance as much as we can. Um, we go on a bike ride or we go for a run every afternoon, but we really don't get out much. And um, we're just kind of trying to do our part because we we don't want to see ourselves or a family member or somebody that we know um, get the coronavirus. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's the financial end of this, the economic side of this is is brutal. But when we really stop and think about it, the last thing we want, as you just said, is for someone we know and love that's close to us to get coronavirus because you just don't, we don't know how, you know, yes, it's affecting the older folks, but you're right. You, you just uh, said that perfectly. Well, and I, something, you know, I was talking to my wife about the other day was if I had a different job, you know, if I had a job, you know, like a like a business, let's say a store where I sold something to people and and that business was closed down because of social distancing. I, I, I think I might see things a little bit differently and I think I might want to, you know, get out there and, and maybe even risk it um, because I might I might see the the economics of it a little bit different so I can I can see where people are 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 wanting to you know to go back to work and and to get out there because maybe they're worried about paying their bills or their mortgage and i understand that um but i really hope we don't open up too quickly mm -hmm. because i think we've made a lot of gains over the last month um where where i think if we would have just continued as business as usual we'd see quite a few more cases um so yeah I don't know. Yeah. Well, what you do know is the financial side of it. And I want to thank you so much for talking to us a little bit. I mean, I feel a little bit better, honestly, just talking to you. Good, good. Yeah. So thank hey, you. Can I, can I say one more? Thing? You can say eight more things if you'd like, Joe Spurgeon. I'll just, I'll just say one more. Um, one, of, one of the people that you might want to have on is uh, Derek Romer from mm -hmm. St. Mary's. We have interviewed him actually, some... I think, for a story. Okay, he's... about about what he's doing in his class? Yeah, he's making the, um, we've talked to a few teachers, I know one specifically at St. Mary's about the 3D printer, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. In, in his class, they're doing uh, 3D printing for a uh, medical device. They're doing uh, sewing of masks. Uh, my daughter has this uh, uh, contraption where she's going to be making some hand sanitizer. Not sure how well that's going to work out, but <laughs> we're going to try. That's um, awesome. And I and I think I think that's neat. And so you know, whatever people can do that that that's positive to help out, uh, I think it's just fantastic. I agree with you, Joe. And we really see in times like this. I hate that it has to take a pandemic, but we are really seeing our community come together and band together and help each other out. It's a beautiful thing. That is, that's wonderful. Okay, Joe Spurgeon, if you are listening to this podcast on Apple's podcast app, you can subscribe, rate and review. It helps other people find us. We're also on Google Play, Stitcher and SoundCloud. The video version of this podcast can be found at ktvl.com. Just click on features and we are also on YouTube. So just search off script with Trish Glows. One more time, Joe Spurgeon, financial advisor, my favorite financial advisor from LPL Financial. Thank you so much for taking the time out and for offering up uh, some wisdom and some knowledge today. We appreciate it. You bet, thanks for having me.